so kind. Uh, that introduction is so much better than the presentation. <laughs> it just is. So yeah, I actually spent 23 years in department, or 22 years in Department of the Navy. I'm a retired medical service corps officer from the Navy, and I spent uh, go Navy. But <laughs> let me. Service corps. Let, no. Were you MSC? Army. Army, uh, rock on. Yeah. But we're, we're it's there. <laughs> but you were probably like in the real army. See, the, the only ship I was ever on was called Carnival. Is it the USS? <laughs> Just, I mean, you were probably in the field. I was at Carnival. I don't want to say, you know. Anyway, thank you, Trina. It's so kind. It's, it's really nice. It, I'm so honored that, that anyone would refer to me as TOC family. This is a, it's a great organization and, and one that we've always wanted to stay very close to in the key program. Uh, just a little bit about, about our program. For those of you who have not heard of us, we are a program at American University. We do leadership development for federal executives uh, at the 11 level and above. We have programs all the way up through SES. And we've done a lot of work over the years, about 40 years in the government. We also have an executive master's program. Can somebody please ask me where we're ranked? Because this just came out a couple of weeks ago. And I'd love for somebody to say, where is your executive MPA ranked? Can somebody ask me, please? It's number three in the country. Somebody asked me where Harvard is ranked. Who cares? They're, they're not in the top three, so nobody cares, all right? So everybody always wants to know, well, who's number one, who's number two? Well, number one is Syracuse. No one will ever unseat Syracuse, and no one wants to live there. Number two is Indiana. Uh, no one wants to live there either. Nothing wrong with Indiana, but... So number, actually two really wonderful programs. We were so happy. We've always been in the top 10 for about as many years as I can recall, but this is the first time we got into the top three. So we're very happy about that. If anyone would like to ask me any questions about our programs, happy to share with you at any other time. But today's subject is about this. And oh, by the way, I do owe you an apology from Dr. Zena Such. Anybody know Dr. Such from OPM? Anybody know her? She's the director, she's the deputy assistant director for diversity, inclusion, and veterans programs at OPM. And she was supposed to join me today. In fact, last night we were working on this presentation together. We were dividing everything up. And then at about 10.30 this morning, she said, oh my gosh, I just got a tasker. I cannot leave OPM. Things are kind of crazy there, as you can imagine right now. And so she said, I can't, I can't show up. Can you do this by yourself? And I'm like, uh-oh. So we're going to see how it goes. No, actually, this is, this is something that, that either one of us could do. But uh, I, I wish she could have been here with me because of her experience. So let's get right to it. This is going to be a very interactive presentation. It's not one that I don't like to talk that much. So I've got a couple of exercises for you all to do. But I want to just kind of share with you the idea that, that kind of fueled this, this presentation. And that was the TED Talk that, that Trina mentioned. It was when I did that, when I talked a lot about time and the impact of time on our lives and our need to reflect. And one of the things that we are all about in our programs at Key is that we are all about reflection. We're all about meditation. We're all about emotional intelligence. We're about vulnerability. We're about humility. Um, we feel that we have spent, our federal leaders in, in, in all sectors have spent way too long bowing at the altar of metrics. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with data. Data is a, data is a good thing. We need data to make good decisions. But when we depend on data at the risk of our relationships, when we depend on data at the risk of trust in an organization or a risk of having an organization that's not compassionate and caring and loving, and we use that word love a lot in our program, when we, when we, when we worship data at the expense of those things, you know, yeah, we can accomplish our mission, sure. Uh, you can coerce people into mission. But people are what matter the most. And so that's what we're about. And since Don Zotter founded this program 40 years ago, and bless his heart, Don passed away in November. It was a very sad day for all of us. But when Don founded this program back 40 years ago, he was talking about emotional intelligence. And he was talking about care and love and taking care of one another and, and, and creating learning environments. And we stand on his shoulders and, and try to do our best to maintain his legacy. This program is, is tied to the TED Talk because we I talked to the TED Talk about time and relationships. And so what I wanted to do, because I, I thank goodness, a Treasury Executive Institute asked me to come out and do a presentation last year for them, and LULAC as well, on this subject. And so I've kind of refined it over time. And this is the argument. The argument is we never have enough time. And by the way, surprise everybody, nobody in this room has a job where you're going to be able to do the following. <sighs> All caught up. <laughs> right? Am I right? 
No one, no one in this, no one in this room has that. Nobody. You don't have enough resources. You don't have enough people. I know. And every, and every federal agency that comes to our program says, "No, we're really special. You don't understand. We are different than other federal agencies." I'm, no, you're not. Everybody's facing the same kind of challenges, just in a different context, right? So we're always facing the issue of time. Technology is fascinating, and then we're going to talk about relationships because that's what our program is all about. So let me read this to you and see if this sounds like anything you know. I am burnt out. I enjoy sharing zingers with Twitter all day. I enjoy writing long, wonky posts at night, but the lifestyle has its drawbacks. I don't get enough sleep ever. I don't have any hobbies. I'm always at work. I'm never disconnected. It's doing things to my brain. Man, I think in tweets now, my hands start twitching if I'm away from my phone for more than 30 seconds. I own that. I, everybody good with this? That sounds like a lot of people we know and maybe some of us in this room. Well, what about this one? How about this one? I can't even go to the bathroom now without getting bored. <laughs> you know, a little bathroom humor never hurt anybody, right? I mean, so I know I'm not the only one tweeting in the bathroom. The online world, which I struggle to remember, represents only a tiny unrepresentative slice of the American public has become my world. I spend more time there than in the real world. Amen to that, right? I mean, we spend so much time connected. So now. And I'm not going to say that technology is not bad. We're not going to beat up on technology here. We're not talking about that. We're talking about its impact on relationships. Let's talk about time first. This was, I, I love this uh, art because it's just so cool looking, right? The Salvador Dali things on time. Um, we can't resist thinking about time. It's the 55th most common word used in the English language. So that's kind of neat to know. We use it all the time. We also use it in songs. All, so yeah, just now, it's now the 54th most common word. No, but we use it in time. So here's my first test for you all today. If I could save time in a bottle, somebody name the artist. Jim Croce, Jim good job. What about just this one, time? Pink Floyd. Oh, we have a rocker up front, good. Too much time on my hands, getting a little tougher. I heard it sticks, absolutely. Time after time. Cindy Lauper. How about that one, this is the time. This is the time. Yeah, one of his worst songs ever. It was. In that stupid Christy Brinkley phase, just horrible music. And then what about the last one, Remember the Time? Do you remember the time? Yeah, that's the one, that's it. Michael Jackson, right. Okay, so see how, you see how familiar we all are with the concept of time? So here's the thing about time. Um, Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that as we get closer to the center of the Earth, time moves more slowly. Okay, I'm not a physicist, don't pretend to be one. But that's what Einstein said. What that means for us is that our feet are younger than our face. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Our feet are younger than our face. Feel free to write these down and use them with <laughs> friends and family because these are neat, neat tidbits to have, right? The other thing about, about time is that the smallest measurable amount of time is called Planck time. And it takes, and the, the good folks out at NIST in Gaithersburg, they do all this work all the time. It takes you about 550,000 trillion, trillion, trillion Planck times to blink once. Tell me how they measured that. Come on, how did they measure that, right? Here's another interesting thing about time. A second isn't what we think it is. Normally we think of a second as just a, you know, 1 60th of a minute. In truth, the real definition is the duration of 9.192 trillion periods of radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. That's how it's really defined. So it exists all around us. We can't control it. We waste it. We don't own it, but we give it away. It's valuable. One of the things I know Zena was going to talk about, when she became an SES, she said that she found that the biggest gift she could give the people that she led was the gift of her time. It wasn't her knowledge. And, and one of the things that we see in, our, in the key programs is we see our, our, our senior GS folks come into the program with this incredible backlog of technical process knowledge. And what we remind them is there hasn't been a federal employee viewpoint survey in 50 years that has ever said, 
gee, I wish my boss knew more about Chapter 4 of the Federal Acquisition Regulations. <laughs> not, 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 nothing against any acquisitions folks in the room, but nobody cares. That's what you're for, right? We love you that you have that technology in your mind. You've got that process in your mind that's really good, but it isn't what people want. What they want is something deeper. They want something more connected. You know, we've seen the word engagement thrown around so much. This is really what they're looking for. And Zena was saying it's really her time. It's, it's her ability to sit down one-on-one -on -one with someone and have that conversation face-to-face. So we don't control it, we don't own it, we feel it passing by, we can't touch it. We're never caught up with time. I mentioned before, you know, John Maynard Keyes in uh, 1930 predicted that by the end of the century, we'd be working by about three hours, we'd only be working about three hours a day. About three hours a day. And, and, and really the issue with time is how we perceive it, what we, what we consider time to be. For example, individuals in cultures that are more rural, are more poor, tend to view time quite differently. Time passes more slowly for them. Uh, people in wealthy, materialized, developed countries don't see time in quite the same way. So London's sense of time, people that live in London, is much more swifter than those who live in Lima. Uh, we also know that people who see their time in terms of money often grow stingy with the time in order to maximize the money. So time has a very incredible impact on what we do. People who are paid by the hour volunteer less of their time and they tend to feel, less, they tend to feel more antsy when they're working because they're thinking by the hour. Uh, cash rich Americans are, are time poor. I mean, we really feel time poor. The people in this room generally, we just don't feel like we have enough time. Even today, before I got here this morning, things that were going on, I must have said 15 times, I just don't have the time to get to that. I don't have the time to get to that. So, so this is the environment in which we're working right now. This, this crunch of time, this sensitivity of time. Throw into this mix technology. So has this been a time saver for us? Yeah? Yeah, it's been a time saver. I look, and, and you know what? That's really, that's really true. But how many of you will admit to the following? You're watching Netflix and you see an actor, and you think you've seen her in something else before, so you pause Netflix, and what do you do? You go to IMDB, you pull up the phone, you, go, you, you, you pause, or you go to, IMDB is good, Internet Movie Database, right? Or you can go to, to Wikipedia, which is the font of all knowledge, and you look at, uh, look at, and you trace that actor back until you see that she had a bit role in, you know, some movie back in the 70s, and you're like, Yes, I got it, I got it. So we're so, we're, how many of you have actually ever folded a map when you were driving? Anybody ever used a map? Did you used a map when you were driving? You remember the maps, right? How many remember triptychs from AAA? Oh yeah, yeah, and we had to get those like a year in advance, right? I'm thinking of driving to New York City in August of 2014 or whatever, yeah, that's right. So how many memorize their own phone numbers? How many, how many in this room will admit to knowing, by heart, knowing five phone numbers or less. Oh, look at this, I, I, I love, it. yeah, oh, of course. I don't know, how about three phone numbers or less? I think I know one, it's my middle daughter because she's the favorite. So I think, I, no, oh, that's not going out, is it, Kurt? That, don't put that out there, yeah. No, so you know, this, this technology has been amazing and we're gonna talk in a minute about, about specific generations, but, but let, me, let me throw these out there. Anybody have a set of those growing up? Uh-huh, aren't they beautiful? Yeah, the world, or Britannica, right? And now they've been replaced with this? I mean, this is really where it is. So, so here's my first exercise for y'all, just a couple minutes, just long enough for me to go refill my iced tea and that's this question. I wanna ask you, how has technology impacted your time? How has it impacted your time? The answer isn't as easy as it seems. And I, I'm gonna allow you to talk at your tables for as long as it takes me to go back there and refill my tea, and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna say, somebody raise your hand and tell me. So, you have a couple minutes. Okay, time is up, time is up. And I, I do wanna to say to, to those of you in the back of the room who, who are contributing so much to the program, we really appreciate it but we have to limit our discussion to the people in the front of the room so we're on camera. So, but we love you back there in those seats a lot. So, what did you all come up with? Uh, technology has been both a benefit and a hindrance for everyone, I believe. Um, 
a lot of it, it keeps us working and doing, just doing, working nonstop, 24 hours, you can check. Email is constant, phone calls are constant. But the other side, the positive side, um, being able to set reminders on our calendars because there is so much to get done. Uh, for me personally, technology that reads aloud for me, not only on my phone, but on my computer. So technology has the good, the bad, and the ugly. Perfect. Thank you so much. Nice job. How about a big TOC thank you for this? Yeah. Um, we said that technology, same thing, there are pros and cons to it. Um, it, it's, it provides an immediate sense of gratification. You don't have to wait for something. If I need to know how to go somewhere or I have a question of something, I can find out right away. Um, I'll see this <laughs> We spend more time. Get yeah. more, more oh yes, and how you can get how you technology lets you get sucked into mm -hmm. a, a, it lets you get sucked in, but Pinterest <laughs> suck in. <laughs> you find it one thing, and two hours later, <laughs> like that IMDb Netflix thing. Right? Yeah, absolutely. No, excellent answers. So you know, this is interesting. I'd like to see what you all think about this. How many times do you think that we change Windows or check email? in a given hour, average, on average? How many times? How many times in an hour? One hour yeah. Yeah. Uh, 37. How many hours? So, so when you think of, now let's think of our time at home. We go home this evening and we consume media in some capacity. So here's how this works. If you're on your phone talking to your favorite daughter and you've got Netflix on and you've got your computer on and you're multitasking, which we're going to talk about later, how many, that's, one, that, that's three hours. So it's, they count, so you have three hours, an hour, this hour, this, they count together, right? So how many hours do you think we consume at home uh, per day? Eight. Yeah, that's called, it's 12, about 12 hours per day. So remember, internet, TV, simultaneously, phone, all count as, as uh, together. Um, websites per day, we check about 40 websites per day on average. Smartphone checks per hour, this is my favorite number right here, nine times. Nine times on average, Americans reach down and pick up that phone and look at it, right? You think it's low? I, yeah, it might be, yeah, yeah, it might be, I, yeah. I checked it nine times going back there and getting tea and coming back. Look at this one. Facebook accounts for one in every six minutes spent online and one in every five minutes spent on mobile. So at Facebook, the, the impact of this is really incredible. 22% of the world's population has a Facebook page. 65 million businesses have Facebook pages, 1.5 billion mobile daily users for Facebook. And look at this, 29 year olds, 88% of the 18 to 29 range are using Facebook and over half of people 65 and older. I mean, that is, that's an amazing statistic. It's amazing. So, so let me, th this question I'm just gonna ask anyone to yell out. What about this one? How has how this technology impacted our relationships? But one thing is for sure, there, there are positives. And, and the last thing I want anyone to think is that I'm coming in and saying, oh, technology's bad. No, technology's great. It's made the world smaller. It's, it's done a lot in terms of developing countries. It's, it's exposed a lot of things, bad things that we, you know, that we see now that we never saw before. So there's definitely good things. And, 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 and having connections, we've all probably made connections with people in our past, or maybe distant relatives or friends from high school. And those are all terrific things. However, there is a however, and I think the point that you made, sir, about, about the younger generation, uh, millennials, uh, but especially Gen Z, who are just now entering the workforce, Gen Z is the first, they're the first true digital natives. They've known nothing else, nothing else. At least, at least, at least the millennials had something before. And so my daughters, my, two of my daughters are millennials and one's a Gen Z. So the millennials, they grew into this and the Facebook came up and you know, I'm looking, I go, wait, what are you doing on the computer? Yeah, that kind of thing, right? But, but here's what we know from, from a social science perspective. We know that with the millennial generation, one of the challenges is that they have, been, they have learned to be able to end relationships by doing what? Yeah, it's a click. Yeah, it's a click. I don't know if any of you watch. Uh, so Simon, Simon Sinek has some really cool stuff out there. Simon Sinek talks about dating. And he said, you know, back when he dated, or when most of us dated, what you had to do was you had to 
look that person in the eye when you asked them out and you had to deal with the rejection and it was just there was a growth there and you had to, your heart got broken you had to, and what Simon Sinek says is now you swipe left swipe right and you're a stud <laughs> yeah that which is hilarious I I don't know what any of that means but I guess but I'm thinking there's some app where you swipe I don't know but he said it and it worked and I'm giving him credit so I think that's a good thing so but yeah my daughter my daughter might know so are we addicted Okay, so, so a, few, a, few questions, a few questions for you. How often do you find that you stay online longer than you intended? How often do you neglect household chores to spend more time online? Uh, how many others in your life complain about the use of the internet, uh, for you using the internet or your phone? Anybody in your life complain about you picking up your phone all the time? You're never, you're never really here, Dad. What, yeah, you're checking your mail. You're always doing, you know, uh, uh, right? I mean, we, we are addicted. In fact, it is a leash. There's been some research that's been done talking about, about what anthropologists call a digital leash. And what they say is that in Western culture, we feel, we feel our value by the value of our network. So if we have a large network, we have a lot of likes, we have a lot of connections, if we have a big Rolodex, which is what we used to have, then we feel some value. And, and the cell phone is that leash that ties us to that network now. And, and that slight jolt that we get when we get a like or when we get a response to a text, or how about this? How about when you text someone and then you see that dot, 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 where you know they're typing back? And how does it feel when that dot, dot, dot's there and you're looking at it like, come on, and, and, then, and, then, and then it goes away. And you're like, what were you going to say? What, what were you going to say that you're now afraid to say to me? So, so that beautiful relationship online now, it's like, what, are you, what were you going to say? I know you were typing. I wasn't typing. Why did you stop typing? I, didn't, I saw the dots. I know you were typing. I mean, whew, it's just so frustrating. So, but here's what happens. I mean, here's what happens. One of the things that in, in leadership science that we're seeing, and this is those of us that have done leadership stuff for years have always felt this way. But now we've got the neuroscience to support it. In the last 25 years, the neuroscience, the research on mirror neurons and other, other chemical reactions in the brain have told us, have now started to prove that when you and I have a connection, that connection is actually a neurochemical connection. There are things that happen in your brain that's happening in my brain, and those are things that we feel. And, so, and we feel them, and we typically feel them lower in our abdomen because they start down in the spleen and they work their way up the vagal nerve into our brain, into very primitive uh, parts of our brain. And, and, and so it's a real feeling. And, it, and when we get those responses on emails or texts or a like or just acknowledgement or, or we go out to LinkedIn and we find out that 37 people viewed our, our profile. I mean, you know, so like today at the end of the day, I'd like to go back home and pull up and see however many are here. I'd like you to view my profile, right? Make me feel good. So actually, I don't check LinkedIn nearly enough. But it's a, it's a nice little platform, but it gives us a jolt. And that jolt is nothing more than an endorphin. It's nothing, more, it's nothing more than the oxytocin rush that we get when we feel loved and we feel wanted and we feel desired, which is the foundation of all human interaction. This is the thing. These smartphones are amazing. Look at this. 60% of us are connected to our work over 13 hours a day. You know, this is a very, very serious issue, folks, because this connection that we have, especially like with email, there's, a, there's one researcher is calling this sleep apnea, uh, Linda Stone. She actually, uh, Linda Stone at Apple, one of the Apple engineers, coined a phrase called continuous partial attention. And what she suggests is that we are, are constantly in a state of continuous partial attention to everything around us because of our focus on our technology, because of our focus on email because of our focus on Facebook, whatever it is that we happen to be doing. And she also termed a phrase called email apnea. This is measurable. What happens often is when we look at our emails, we don't breathe as deeply. <laughs> so so let, let me just say that again. Our bodies are not getting enough oxygen because we're so engaged with the email. And that's really bad because that throws our carbon dioxide out of whack and it can create all kinds of physiological problems, stress-related conditions. Those things happen a lot. Those are real, real problems for us. So it's a, it's a very fascinating topic. This is this 79%, you know what that number is? That's the number of people that check their email while on vacation. Ooh. Now look, I know what you're gonna say, but my job is really important. I can't possibly be away. <laughs> I've heard it from everybody, believe me. And we all feel that way. We all feel like our jobs are so important that we just cannot possibly do it. 
I understand. It's hard. And you know what? And I fight that. I fight that as well. It's a very difficult challenge for all of us. What about multitasking? So now that we've got all these tools to play with, and we don't have enough time, and all these tools to play with, we multitask. Do you think that works? No. no. Why does it not work? So, so I'm going to tell you all, I'm going to give you, so for those of you that, that have a chance to, if you remember this, or you can send me an email, I can tell you how to do it. There's a really interesting tool that you can use to test people on multitasking. What you ask them to do is you have them draw two horizontal lines on a piece of paper. And on the top line, you have them write, I am a good multitasker. And you have someone time it. It takes about eight seconds. And then you have them on the next line write numbers 1 to 22. And that takes about 30 seconds or so. Have that time. And then you ask them to do this. Then you draw two more lines. You have someone time them and you say, okay, now, do the same task, but this time, write the word, the letter I, and the number 1. The letter A, the number 2. The letter M, the number 3. Back and forth and see how long that takes you. The fact of the matter is we really aren't good multitaskers. What's really happening is it slows us down. All of these things occur in terms of uh, tasking. You can't this only handle it once. That goes out the window when we multitask. And look, there are, the, what, what the researchers say, what psychologists and, and neuroscientists say, is there are about 2% of the population that do have the neurological pathways to make this happen but that's not many of us. One study at the University of Utah found that drivers took longer to reach their destinations when they talked on their cell phones. Others have found a 40% loss in productivity when we multitask. It's extremely difficult to do, and it's extremely difficult to do well. So I think the, the, the impact of this on our, you know, the, the time, the technology, the impact on our relationship and our, on the things that we do is huge. Impact on learning, for example. Yes, like, yes, technology helps us learn. There's, uh, there's one thing that uh, researchers have found in terms of becoming a memory partner. They found that digital devices kind of help us offload information that we don't need to store in our brains, which is an advantage. That's a good thing. However, what they're also finding is that the offloading of that information is having an impact on our ability to be creative and innovative because we don't have those neural pathways in place. We don't have those uh, ganglions there to draw on, to build from, because we've offloaded them. So it's a pro and a con. Yes, it helps, but yes, there's a danger. Another impact, I think, of, of technology is this too much information stuff. How many of you have seen people posting bunion surgery pictures on Facebook? I mean, really? Do we really need to know that? I mean, and how many times have we seen this, where technology is the avoidance tool that we use. I mean, this is, it's so easy. I'm just going to email. I'm not going to go see them in person. I'll email. Or you know what? Better yet, I'm not going to email them. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel when people don't respond to your email? Especially if you're in the midst of a debate back and forth and all of a sudden it's radio silence on that end. So, so technology gives us an amazing avoidance tool. And this goes back to what I was saying before about the millennials and about Gen Z. And that is that I don't think that technology allows us to really grow our relationships. I think it allows us, and I'm just making this up as I say it, <laughs> and I like this. This just came into my mind. I'm like, you know what? This is good. I'm an extrovert, so I think as I speak. I, you couldn't tell, right? I like this. What I'm about to say, I'm going to like this, and that is that I don't, I don't think it helps us grow our relationships, but I think it helps us expand our network. So I can reach out, and I've got a lot more contact with a lot more people, but I don't feel like I have real relationships with them. I had a, a friend in the Navy whose name was Glenn. Glenn was a great guy. He was a health policy dude, really sharp. Glenn was the kind of person that when he shook your hand, he would look at you for a second, and then he'd look over your shoulder, and he'd be like, yeah, so let's get together soon. Uh, have your secretary call mine. We'll pencil in lunch. You know, he's looking around the room to see who the next important person to come into the room is. Well, Glenn felt that he had a lot of relationships. It was really sad because a lot of the people that knew him didn't think a lot of him because he was just a, he was a, he was a shyster, man. The guy was out and about. He was doing his thing. He was cutting deals. There was always something, there was always something kind of, you know, kind of creepy about what he was doing. It never felt real. And it was just kind of like one transaction after another. And it really wasn't a relationship. And I think that, that technology has the potential of, of hurting relationships if we're not careful. So for example, you know, we can be emotionally invisible uh, on, on, um, 
on, on websites and certainly on, and I, I can tell you right now one of the things that's happened at the university level I teach one graduate course a semester with traditional grad students and what happens in that course is that what we found is that when we went to online evaluations of professors all of our rankings went down what happens? Well, what happens is that Jimmy decides he's going to go home and go on social media and write about Professor Malone and how he couldn't stand Professor Malone because I gave him a B and he's never gotten a B in his entire graduate course, you know, career. And, and, and all of a sudden the grades start to drop because there's, there's an isolation there. And it allows us to, you know, it allows us to kind of build those walls. And as I mentioned, I think for Gen Y it's a challenge. It, it, we don't know yet what the real impact is going to be. On, on Generation Y and Gen Z. We don't, we don't know yet in the workplace. We're just starting to see it. But I can tell you with my Gen Y students, they are telling me that they struggle with relationships in the workplace. They don't understand. I have, I have a daughter and a son-in-law who have both, they both keep quitting jobs because they're like, oh, just, there's just me. I just can't get along with them. I mean, my boss just can't get along with them. They're just whatever. And I'm like, well, you know, I've worked for a lot of people I don't like. <laughs> You know, I mean, so it happens, right? So it's, I think it's probably time for us to revisit this, and that's revisit the whole idea of laughing together, of being present, truly, truly present with one another, of really exhibiting empathy to one another. Brene Brown has a beautiful YouTube video on empathy. I really recommend you watch it, where she talks about it's us getting down into the pit with someone and feeling the feelings that they feel. And, and, and this is not easy to do electronically. It's just hard to do electronically. Online education, so in our field, online education is a big thing. We don't do online education in the key program, and we never will. We never will, because we cannot build trusting, emotionally intelligent, connected cohorts online. We can't do it. And if anyone knows how, I'm all ears. Because the best, the best online programs, by the way, for any of you who are doing this or you know someone who is, the best online programs always have a residential component. There's always a time when you get together in person. That's how it works best. So my question to you is who wins? I think it's technology for now, but I think that there are things that we can do, and I'm just gonna hit a couple of these for you, and then certainly open it up to questions. And this is what they are. I, I, we feel very strongly about these things in the key program. These are very important for leading. You know, leadership is about, it's really about relationships. Um, I don't have any famous quotes, but I'm, I'd like to get famous for one. And that's the following. So start writing, take out your phones. No, no this, is, this, is, this is the quote. The quote is this. People may admire you for what you know, but they're never going to be inspired by what you know. Right? Martin Luther King did not have the success he had by standing up on a rock and saying, I have a plan. No, Dr. King connected with people at the heart and soul level. And that's what leaders do. It's not about what we know. We wouldn't be where we are. No one in this room would be where you are if you didn't know your stuff. You got your stuff, that's good. It's not about that anymore. It's now about connecting with others. It's about inspiring people. It's about letting your guard down. It's about being a little humble, maybe being a little funny, maybe relaxing a little bit. It's all okay. You know, we're very blessed to be where we are. We're lucky to live where we live. And to be able to share that kindness and love with one another is important and that's what builds you know, all the creative, innovative workplaces, everyone wants to go to work for Google, I gotta go work for Amazon, man. They're coming, they're coming to North, you know, how many of you put in, how many of you have put in applications at Amazon now? Because they're, don't raise your hand, but I'm sure somebody has, because they're coming to Northern Virginia. I gotta work for Amazon. Well, what makes those companies great, that they're, they're subject to all the federal labor laws that any other organization is subject to. So this whole thing about, well, I don't even have a job, man. Like, I don't even get paid. I don't even have a title. There's no titles at my organization, man. We're just like so out there. No, that's not true. They're all out there. But what they create is a family. They create love and relationships. And it doesn't mean we don't hold people accountable but we let ourselves connect as human beings. And I think that's the secret to managing our time and managing our technology. Self-awareness, the most difficult component of emotional intelligence, self-awareness. Dan Goleman, wonderful book, Primal Leadership, writes all about it. anything Dan wrote, anything Linda Hill out of Harvard writes, her stuff is awesome about self-awareness and management and leadership. How many times do we really take the time to recognize who we are and how we've changed. Because we are different now than we were a year ago and three years ago and five years ago. And, and what we find is that leaders in the government who don't recognize that things have changed. I've had team building already. I had it when I was in my MPA program in 1944. I don't need it anymore. Well, yeah, you do, cowboy. And I'm telling you what, if you don't, 
then you're part of the problem. I mean, that's it. We got to revisit this stuff, right? I just so the new so yesterday they announced a new head of the U.S. Secret Service. He is a graduate of the Key program, and I emailed Jim last night. I said, Jim, we are so happy to have one of the family out there running Secret Service. God bless you. Good luck. What can we do? He wrote back to me this morning. He goes, Patrick, I learned so much about myself, and, and it was so transforming being in that program, and it was because of what we do there, the self-awareness. And this is how we make time and technology work for us. Self-management. I don't know about you all, but for me, it's that self-management piece. That's that the fire in the brakes thing. You feel that emotion, you're self-aware, and then you have a reaction, right? Self-management is being able to take that deep breath before we have that reaction. So my thing that I face in the self-management world, and I'll face it today when I go to Chipotle before my class tonight, <laughs> is there will be some moron reaching over the glass to point to the sour cream. And, and his dirty fingernails are hanging over the sour cream. And he's like, I want sour cream on my burrito. And the poor person behind there, I think he knows that that's the sour cream. I don't think you have to tell the person with the Chipotle shirt on that the white stuff is the sour cream. And I'm like, can you pull, and I've got a thing with FDA in a couple weeks for ethics, and I'm going to ask for a badge. I want somebody to give me a badge that I can whip out and say, I'm going to close this place down if you don't get your hand off that. That's poor self-management. But that's where we need, right, we got to have it. Social awareness, being able to read, being able to read others. You can't read others when you're looking at your phone. You can't read others when you're checking your phone. You can't read others if you're, oh, I got this, and you're typing. It. it just doesn't work. You got to put that aside. Remember, we don't have enough time. Just take it. It's not going to happen. But you got to make the time. There's no other solution. We have to make the time. And that doesn't mean we have to spend 45 minutes talking to everybody every morning, ask them how their day was. But we do have to make some small connection. And what research, so, so University of California, Berkeley, I'm sorry, I'm going to get off on kindness. I'm going to run over. I'll stop. University of California, Berkeley has done some really cool research on kindness. And what they found is that even the smallest gestures of kindness in the workplace beget other gestures of kindness. When we witness kindness, good things happen to us physiologically. When we are kind and others see it, good things happen to them. It, it, and, and they're finding that kindness and compassion are, listen to this, as big of determinants of health as smoking. Kindness and compassion, practicing kindness, being aware of others, is as important to our physical health as smoking. That's the impact it has. It's huge. No one wants to hear this, oh, this is the social science, there's not really no metrics behind it. Yeah, there is. There is. The science is out there. Relationship management, this is, this is what I think we are missing if we fall into that time and technology trap. And that's the, so I got here, I got here today, and Trina walked up to me, and I said, hey, how you doing? And I'm a hugger, but I can't always remember who's a hugger. So, so, and here's how huggers know this, because if you're a hugger and you, you start you, to make that launch and the person is like this, you know, <laughs> back off, okay? Just back off, right? So Trina walks up to me today, and I reach over to shake her hand because I couldn't remember she was a hugger. She's got those arms outstretched, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in. I'm diving in, I'm diving in. You know, we, we can't hug, we can't hug a lot when those computers and those phones are in between us. So, so I, think, I think my final message is this, that the, the time thing we're never going to get around. The technology, by and large, I think has been extremely positive, no doubt about it, as long as we keep it in context. It's never going to replace that. It's never going to replace it, ever. I am not, I am not uh, shackled by the Hatch Act, so I can say what I want. So I'm going to say what I want right now, and that is that that, that, that people in our line of work, people that work in our program, we see you as our heroes. You deliver democracy and you deliver civilization to this country every single day. The sad part of that is that many of our officials, our elected officials on both sides of the aisle, many of them don't understand it, they don't recognize it, and many of our citizens don't recognize what you do. They don't understand. And, and it, so it's a calling, and it's a noble calling, and that's why we've devoted our careers and the work that we do to serving you. So we say thank you to you for the work that you do in serving our nation. So thank you all very much, and it was a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you.